Guys, uh, first of all, it's so good to see a lot of you guys back this week. I know last week was, uh, well, it was like snow ice weirdness, and so a lot of you weren't able to make it out. Um, highly, highly recommend. If you weren't able to catch last week in person or catch the live stream, uh, Jill Thomas is a good friend of ours and came, and man, she did an absolutely incredible job walking us through um, just really how do we as Christians think about and handle well our mental health, and we answered a lot of the questions that you guys sent in as well, and so if you guys didn't get a chance to come for that or to watch that yet, go on our YouTube page, watch that. We don't get monetized, so I'm not making any money off of it, so whatever, but just go do it. Okay, that's thing number one. Thing number two, thing, I don't know. Uh, Thing number two is this. We get to start a new teaching series tonight, and I'm really excited about it. How many of you guys, if I say Sermon on the Mount, you at least have an idea, kind of, you have an idea what it is? Okay, some, not, okay, yeah, a lot of you don't, a lot of you do, okay, cool. That's exactly what I I was like, okay, I wanted to gauge, if you're like, I've heard this a million times, and like, everyone's like, we'll get off the stage, it's fine. Okay, no, we're gonna talk about it, Um, but before we get to it, I kinda wanna set the scene for what it is. So we're gonna be in Matthew, over the next few weeks, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter five and six, the sermon is actually five, six, and seven. And here's where it is. It falls right into the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. But to really understand why Matthew and nobody else takes the time to record all of this like he does, I think you just, I just wanna kind of peel back the layers just a little bit on why were the gospels written? Because there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each of these gospels does essentially the same thing in a way, right? Like it's, all, if you read it, it's full of the red letters of Jesus because it's a kind of a biography, if you will, of like Jesus' life. It's, hey, what did he go around? What did he do? What did he say? What did he accomplish? So it's all of these things are 100% in all four Gospels. That's what you need to know. Number two, so there is some overlap. Number two, you need to know that they all agree with each other. So if you read all four Gospels and you stack it up, there's gonna be some things that one author doesn't even talk about. There's gonna be other things that maybe both authors or all the authors will talk about the same things, but you're gonna get maybe different lenses. But if you stack them all up, not only are they all recording Jesus' life, but they actually all agree with each other, but they were all written for a little bit different purpose. Every audience was a little bit different. Every purpose of why he wrote these things down was a little bit different. And why you're writing determines what you say. And so the book of Matthew was written by, well, Matthew to a Jewish audience. It was written to a bunch of Jews. Jews had been for centuries waiting for the coming Messiah. They knew there was like this Messiah King coming. They were expecting someone who would come and who would rescue them from all of the oppression, from all of the, like the enslavement, from all of the the Roman overlords, like they were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for a king. And Matthew wrote his gospel with the lens of Jesus is that king. By the way, if you wanna, if you wanna I can talk more about some of the other gospels. Um, Mark really wanted to emphasize that Jesus was really human, that he wasn't just faking it. Uh, John really wanted to in- emphasize that Jesus really was God. And Luke, his whole purpose was that to, he says it this way, to write an orderly account. In other words, while the other books are a collection of stories arranged topically, Luke is a in order chronological look at Jesus' life. So there's four gospels with kind of four different lenses, but Matthew's was, I really want you to see that Jesus is the king, the Messiah that you've been waiting for. Okay, and that's important when we get to the Sermon on the Mount because of what it's going to accomplish and what Jesus is going to do. So Jesus, right here in Matthew chapter five, is the very beginning of his ministry. He's just started to teach. In Matthew chapter four, you see he's calling the last of his disciples. He's now got his, he's known as a rabbi now. He's got his followers, his disciples. And here's what he's gonna do in Matthew chapter five, is he's going to begin to lay out what life in his kingdom would look like. So if Jesus really is the Messiah King the Jews had been waiting for, then what kind of king is he going to be? Right, this, think about it this way, like presidential elections. Love them, right? Love the commercials, 
Love the debates, love the way your parents get in angry Facebook arguments, right? Like all of the things. No, we don't love them, we hate them. But what happens every election cycle? Somebody new comes to the, comes to the stage and says, as your president, I am going to X, Y, Z. And they give you this list of like completely unrealistic promises, right? I'm going to end homelessness for puppies, right? Like, and you're like, yes, I'm voting for that guy, right? He's like, in other words, what kind of rule am I going to establish? And when Jesus shows up on the scene in Matthew chapter five, six, and seven, he's actually laying out what kind of a kingdom am I coming to bring? And the people are wondering, his disciples are wondering, is it gonna be like an overthrow of, of, of the Roman people? Is it gonna be like a kingdom of power, a kingdom of might, a kingdom of armies? Like, yes, Jesus, tell us what kind of kingdom it's gonna be. And so there, here, Jesus, this is the longest single block of teaching ever recorded from Jesus. And it's gonna lay out, kind of peel back the curtain on what kind of kingdom is Jesus bringing? And so here, Jesus is starting and he's getting ready to lay out his brand new society, his brand new world. What are the rules? Who is the winners? Who are the losers? What does winning look like in this new world? That's the Sermon on the Mount, okay? And we're gonna be jumping into that over the next several weeks. But here's what, here's what I was thinking about this this week. When you get to lay out a brand new society from scratch, like if you could make all the rules, if you could decide what winning looks like, what would you choose? Uh, a few years ago, I say a few years ago, 2007, okay? Uh, so more than a few years ago, um, I didn't even have kids yet because my oldest daughter is gonna be 15 tomorrow. Happy birthday, Addie. Uh, yeah, you can clap for that. Um, she loves it when I embarrass her, it's great. Okay, uh, they had this show on CBS, it was called Kid Nation, okay? All of these like reality TV shows were getting really big. And they're like, let's try one with all children. They took 40 children and they dropped them into this abandoned town in New Mexico. It's literally like this town is owned, like privately owned. You like has like one, like think about like old Western movies. It's got like one street with like the saloon and the bank and the store and the bank, right? It's like, and they're like, hey guys, you're now a society. You get to decide what the rules are gonna be. You get to decide what the rewards are. You get to decide what jobs do you get paid for? How much do you get paid? Like you get to decide all of these things with like no adult supervision. First of all, terrible idea, okay? It's like Lord of the Flies. If you had to read that for school, not a good thing, okay? Not good. And in hindsight, probably not a good idea for a television show. But what was really interesting to me about this is that given the chance to start from scratch as innocent eight to 10 year olds. I mean, like we're not talking like 15 year olds, right? Eight to 10. In just a matter of like days and weeks, the kind of society that they began actually resembled a lot the society that they came from. They like began to have the same and show the same prejudices that their parents had. They began to show the same laziness that maybe they had at home and yeah, they didn't have an Xbox, but they traded playing Xbox for just sitting around the saloon sipping on an orange crush, okay? I'm not even joking. They traded maybe alcoholism for sugar, for sugar hangovers, but the society they created wasn't all that different, and here's why. Because the hearts were the same. At the end of the day, they weren't new creations. They weren't new creatures. Like They were just a product of the parents that they had and the house they grew up in. And I say that, and it's really important for you guys to hear this idea, because when Jesus sets up a brand new economy, when Jesus sets up a brand new kingdom, it has to come with a brand new heart. It has to come with brand new desires. It has to come with brand new value systems. Because otherwise, we're gonna do the same thing to Jesus' new kingdom that those kids did in the, this town in New Mexico, in Kid Nation. And so here we are, we're getting ready to hear what kind of kingdom Jesus wants to establish. And the very first thing that he's going to do is he's going to say, hey, I want you to know in my kingdom what kinds of things are going to be celebrated and what kinds of people are going to be blessed. Okay, so that is where we're going to be. We're going to be starting in with the passage called the Beatitudes is Matthew chapter five, verse one. Here it is. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and, they, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. So it's just him and his, fo his closest followers. And he began to teach them, saying, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven for that is how they persecuted the prophets who came before you. Blessed are fill in the blank. What does it mean to be blessed? Here's, what, here's a definition for blessed. To be blessed means to be divinely or supremely favored. So favored by God, by whatever the, the divine being is that you believe in, right? It means to be happy or fortunate, Divinely or supremely favored. That sounds pretty good, right? Um, I was thinking about this. In our culture, what do we consider and who do we consider to be fortunate, happy, or divinely blessed? Like if you were writing the Beatitudes for America, like what would you say? Um, I took a stab at it. If I was writing the Beatitudes for the American kingdom, it would probably, I think, sound something like this. I'd love to hear your take in Connection Group. Blessed are the achievers, for they earn the kingdom. Blessed are the happy, because they don't need anyone to comfort them. Blessed are the confident and the attractive because they will find a way to win. Blessed are those who are self-sufficient because they don't need anyone or anything else. Blessed are the ones that get even and make sure anyone who wrongs them gets what's coming to them. Blessed are the ones who can manipulate or trick others for their own advantage. Blessed are the ones who have an easy life. Blessed are you when everyone flatters you and speaks only good things about you because you're now living your best life life, right? Like if I was writing the Beatitudes for America, does that sound pretty accurate? It's a far cry from what we just read about Jesus. So you've got these two conflicting realities, right? The earthly reality is that it's all centered around me and my success. But if you look at everything that Jesus just said, we're going to take a look through the list. It's the complete opposite of what you would expect of a king that you wanted to vote for, right? Like the king that you wanted to follow, Let's just walk through the list a piece at a time. He said this, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you want to write a definition down for poor in spirit, it's this. It's that you understand your spiritual poverty. You understand that you don't have anything good to offer God. Here's the reality. He says, blessed are the people who when they come to God, they don't show him a a, a list of the things that they did. Instead, they actually own the fact that they've done nothing to deserve him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who have nothing to offer, okay? Blessed are those who mourn, who experience sorrow, regret, sadness, and loss. But specifically, this is talking about those who mourn over their sin. And that's gonna be really important later, so hang on to that. It says they are gonna be comforted. So you've got the poor in spirit, You've got those who mourn over their sin. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They have a desire for God's kingdom and God's word. They're like, man, I can't get enough of the God stuff. Blessed are those people because they will be filled. And if you look at something, all of these are actually inward. They're rotated into us. And it's like, hey, this is like the who you are. This has nothing to do yet with what you do or how you behave. It's at your core, it's, man, I understand this to be true about myself. It's your own disposition, right? It's a disposition of spiritual poverty, mourning, humility, and thirst. But then he's gonna set four that are outward, right? And I want you to see this. He says, blessed are the merciful, the ones who would bring relief, compassion, and forgiveness because they will be shown mercy Blessed are the pure in heart. That's the one that I was like, I don't know what that means. And I had to spend some time with that. But it's this idea. They are those who live out of a single purpose and motive. They're not underhanded or like duplicitous, right? Like you all know somebody who like they talk to you and their words mean one thing, but their intention is something else, right? Like you know that they're manipulating you for their own gain. They play games with people. 
He says, no, 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 not like that. The pure in heart are people that when they speak something, when they commit to something, what they say is who they are on the inside. Number three, on the outward ones, the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. He says, they are the ones who will be called the sons of God. They're not just not, just not starting fights, but actively living their lives to reconcile people who were previously fighting, to bring together two parties. And it says that they're gonna be called the sons of God, and it's because this, they are gonna be brought together, they're gonna bring together other people because they themselves recognize that they've been brought together with God. So, and then finally, the insulted and the persecuted. He says the insulted and the persecuted because your reward is great in heaven. So when those things are true of you, Jesus says you're blessed. And by our standards, that makes no sense. Only in this brand new kingdom with a brand new heart and a brand new set of values does this make any sense. And so I think the, the question, what I wanna spend the last couple minutes on is this, um, what do we do with this? Like, why do we need to know this? And I think there's two, like maybe one tendency that I want to avoid. Here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to make a list of eight things and to walk away from here going, hey, I checked off on this list of eight things. I'm a six out of eight. I think I'm doing pretty good. You know what? I'm, I'm pretty merciful to people. I'm pretty like this. I'm, I'm pretty like this. And give yourself a score and walk out of here thinking you're pretty good. Or on the flip side, to get, walk out of here feeling sad and go like, man, I only scored two out of eight. I bet I'm not getting into the kingdom. It's not a checklist. That's not what God designed it to be. It's, that is never what Jesus intended. Instead of it being a list of random good things that we're supposed to be and do, think of it this. It's the building blocks of the kingdom life. See, a lot of theologians would actually say that these things are not just a list, but they actually begin to stack on top of each other. And you're gonna pardon my poor handwriting, but I'm gonna draw it out because I think it's gonna help make way more sense. Um, the foundation of all of these is the very first one where he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And so what he does is he puts this, this base in of the poor in spirit. And I'm not gonna write out the whole thing because it'll take forever. And he says, look, when you understand and you build your life on the fact that you are being invited into a kingdom that you don't deserve to be in, everything else can build on that. Everything about the kingdom life is built on the foundation that you don't deserve to be there. And if there was one thing I wanted you to remember tonight, it would be this, it would be this, that the kingdom belongs to those who don't know they don't deserve it. The kingdom belongs to the people who know they don't deserve it. We can't earn our way into the kingdom of God. We have nothing to offer him. And we're not just coming in neutral like, well, I came in with zero dollars in my pocket. We're actually coming in massively in debt because we bring to the kingdom with us all of our sin, all of our baggage, and we recognize that, man, there is no reason that God should want me in his new kingdom world, but he does. And then being poor in spirit produces in us a mourning for our sin and a humility. So he says it produces in us this mourning, so we're gonna mourn and we're gonna be humble. In other words, we recognize that we did not deserve to occupy the kingdom because of the sin that we bring. And we go, man, it breaks our hearts. We're like, God, I am so sorry for the way that I've lived for myself. I'm sorry for the fact that I've lived to take advantage of other people. God, I'm sorry that I've lived for, fill in the blank with your sin. He says, this is built on the realization that I don't deserve to be here. And it produces in me this humility of like, man, I'm a mess. I'm a wreck apart from Jesus. I don't deserve anything good because I'm a sinner who doesn't deserve to be in the kingdom. And all of a sudden, pride has gone out of our lives because we're not stacking up to see, am I a little bit better at being X, Y, or Z than the other person? So you've got mourning for your sin and your humility. And then when you begin to see yourself the way that God sees you, when you begin to mourn your sin, then it, at that point, you see God's love for you anyway, and it begins to create in you a hunger and a thirst. And so now, on the foundation here, you're going to begin to stack this hunger and, oh, here we go. This is wobbly as all get out. A hunger, whoa, 
and thirst. You're not gonna be able to read it. It doesn't matter. You know what I'm saying, okay? A hunger and thirst after the things of God. And here's why this is important. How many times have you been like, oh, man, I know I should read my Bible, but I just, I keep forgetting. It doesn't matter that much to me. Like, man, I know it should matter to me, but it doesn't. I'm not very hungry or thirsty after the things of God. And sometimes what we do is we say, hey, you know what I just need to do? I just gotta be more disciplined and be more, I just gotta go read my Bible and like push myself into it. And what Jesus is saying, actually, it's because you're not, you don't actually recognize the condition of your heart. You don't actually have the humility that you're being invited into a kingdom that you don't deserve. And man, if you would wrap your head around that, it would create in you a desire to know the one who invited you in anyway. And then to that, we move to the external because out of all of these things, he then begins to add the fact that you live in mercy. You understand that God in his mercy invited you into a place that you didn't deserve. And you go, man, if that's true, I want to extend mercy to the people around me. You begin to live in a way that is pure. You go, man, Jesus died on the cross for my sin and he got nothing out of the deal except his own suffering and death. He did it even though there was nothing in it for him he did it pure of heart and pure of motive. I want to live that way too. And man, if that's true, that Jesus actually made peace between me and God, I want to be the kind of person who brings peace with other people. And so if you look at this, and the tendency for us is to leave a sermon like this and go, I need to be a better mercy person. And maybe it's true. Maybe you're here and you struggle to be merciful to people who have wronged you. Maybe you're here and you live to get even. My challenge for you would be, if that's true of you, if you are a manipul you'd struggle with manipulation of people, with ulterior motives, if maybe instead of a peacemaker, you're a troublemaker, if maybe you're like stirring up trouble with the people in your friend group, with the people at school, if maybe you just, there's something about you that just loves pushing people's buttons and getting people a little bit riled up. If these things are true of you, the issue isn't that you're not good enough at doing these things. It's actually that you don't really understand this. Because when we understand that we are poor in spirit, that we did not deserve the kingdom of God, it moves us to mourn our sin. It moves us to want to know him better and then to show this kind of mercy, purity, and peace to the people around us. Guys, the action step here tonight is super simple. Sometimes I'm like, hey, I got eight things I need you to go do. This isn't one of those nights. It's so simple. Guys, I I have a question for you. Has there been a point in your life where you recognize and you just owned the fact that you don't deserve the kingdom of God and you cannot earn the kingdom of God and you moved from trying to earn it to just accepting the fact that you don't deserve it. The kingdom belongs to the ones who know they don't deserve it. Has there been a time when you were brought to a place of being truly poor in spirit? If there's never been that moment for you, this is an opportunity to go, Jesus, I've realized I don't stack up. Would you help me? But maybe there's been a time like that for you. There was a time when you recognized it, but you've been in the church so long and you've become kind of good at this whole Jesus following thing. And yeah, you kind of read your Bible and like you're like, I'm, I'm kind of a good person. And so you've become numb to your own spiritual poverty. And maybe this is just a reminder for you to look in the mirror if you've begun to forget, and maybe you've taken on the habit of comparing yourself to other Christians instead of the standard that God holds up for his kingdom, it's an opportunity to remember, to go back where it started and say, Jesus, would you humble me one time again? But maybe you're just here and you're just massively discouraged because you're like, I'm trying. I'm trying so hard, and I know I don't deserve the kingdom of God. But even still, I just can't seem to get it figured out. 
There's one more thing I want you to know, one more piece of good news. That as much as we desire that this list becomes, a, that this, this, these building blocks become an accurate representation of our hearts and lives, it's already an accurate picture of Jesus himself. You see, Jesus was meek and he was lowly. Jesus was merciful and pure in heart. He was a peacemaker who suffered unjustly because he loves us. And his promise is this, if we come to him, owning our spiritual brokenness, he'll actually transform us and begin to empower us to live this out in a way that we can never do on our own. Y'all, the, the kingdom belongs to the ones who know they don't deserve it. So just own it. Just own it. The fact that you, you don't deserve it. And say, Lord, would you create in me the kind of heart and the kind of life. God, I want to hunger and thirst after you. God, I want to be a person of mercy and peace. Let's pray. Um, Jesus, this has been a tough week. I just, I've been wrestling and thinking about this text and confronted with the fact that honestly, I, I don't live it out very well. And God, it's convicted me that I think sometimes I forget how spiritually broken and impoverished I really am. So God, the way that it's convicted me, I pray that there'd be Christians in this room who would realize that they've moved from humility to arrogance. And God, would you humble us once again. And God, for the people in this room who actually don't have a relationship with you yet, maybe the ones who are, they're trying to stair-step their way to heaven. They're trying to, to do all of the things and climb, climb the ladder and keep do enough to make you happy and to get their way there. God, would you help them maybe for the very first time to realize that their, this kingdom belongs to the ones who just admit they don't deserve it. And then God, would you help them in surrender to say, Jesus, I can't earn my way into your kingdom, but would you accept me? And would you begin to transform me, Jesus? I need you. God, for anyone who just prayed that and is in the process of, 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 of asking you to do that, God, I just pray that you would, you would show yourself to them tonight. God, we love you. We want to be like you. I can't wait to the time that we fully get to enjoy your kingdom for everything that it is. God, would you help us? In your name we pray.